We're talking about motivation in the Venus Project. The question also often comes up, what will motivate people if they have access to all the necessities of life? In the monetary system, we use money. We use money to activate people, to get them to do a job, whether it's repair your car, surgery, repair your roof, they always get money for it. That's a society you live under. And you think, oh, that's the only thing, because there is nothing else out there. But you forget that many people, many famous artists who were, or a very particular famous artist who was a banker, who gave up banking, he went to the South Seas because he wanted to paint Gauguin. He gave up his family, his children, his wife, and his bank job because he wanted to paint pictures. He didn't want money, he just wanted to paint pictures. Now there are lots of people like that. I would say, as I've always said before, all the people of the earth are carried on the backs of possibly no more than a hundred people. You don't need to condition everybody to want to, to do something for no financial reward. But there are other kinds of rewards, and people are not brought up to think about that. What are the other rewards? Well, Martin Luther King marched into the South without anybody building him a new church or giving him money or a suit of clothes or a car. He did it because he believed in social change. I would say that I don't necessarily agree with those people, but I would say that Karl Marx and uh, all the people that were radicals got no money for being radicals. They did it because they believed in what they were doing. They put their lives up because they believed in what they were doing. Many soldiers don't earn a lot of money. What's their incentive? They put their lives up for their country because they're brought up to believe in their country. So I would say that motivation has to do with reinforcement. If money is the reward or reinforcer, the behavior will continue. But if it's the well-being of your fellow human beings, that's a very great motivational system. And I would say more people are motivated by doing good, what they call good, the way they were brought up to believe in it, they're motivated. Why does a person donate funds to the Venus Project? They don't get any funds back because they believe in it. So obviously, uh, there are a few people here that I'd like to ask, Joe, why do you put out all this effort for nothing? When you answer that, what's your motivation? You never got paid working here. You volunteered to work here. Why? I, I get a lot out of it every day. What do you get out of it if it isn't money? I learn something new about how I relate to the world in a different way. Larry, why do you work here? You work so hard for nothing. I don't understand that. Why do you work so hard? I think it's, say, I'm investing or sacrificing my time, my energy, towards a direction that I feel is necessary. And oh, what's the matter? You can earn a lot of money on the outside. Yeah, I did in the past, but as you say, the rewards really, it doesn't come close to the, the results of, of maintaining or upgrading whatever I can to contribute to the Venus Project. It's not a matter of the monetary, there's no money involved, right? But it's the, um, the opportunity to contribute whatever it is that I can to help you in Roxanne. It's whatever it is I can do to assist to have this become tangible in the future. Yeah, but there's no promise of reward. This may not work. I think that it really can, Jacques. Uh, we're going to have to eventually go to this direction. Okay. Out of anything out there, I think this is the best organization to be part of. Okay. Roxanne, why do you work for 30 years and you never got a buck out of this work at all? I lost all my money into it. I don't see anything else out there 
worth working towards. I think it's the most significant thing I've ever seen. What have you got to show for it, though? What have you got in cash or property? Not a penny. Not a penny. Why it's do you work? It's more worthwhile because I think you gave me a brain. <laughs> It gave me a platform to look at the world through that makes more sense than anything I've ever seen. I don't see anything else out there worth working towards. You, you work to yourself. There's no security in this system. You can save up hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can get cancer and you can kiss it all goodbye. This system is running the people and the earth into the ground. And I don't see any solutions within this system. This, the Venus Project is the only system I've seen that may have some hope for the future. What about uh, guys like Gandhi? They worked all their lives to free India from England. And he did it not because anybody deposited anything in the bank for him. He did it because he believed in it. I think this is true of Martin Luther King, of everybody that worked, that believed in what they were doing. The early scientists were tortured, ridiculed, and in prison for what they believed. They weren't given any money. In fact, they lost their income by working on things they believed in. And I would say that even Einstein was, uh, was failed in school in mathematics. They said he'd never amount to anything, the teacher. But he believed in what he was doing. He went right on doing it. Now, I've been working for 75 years for nothing. I never got any money for it. In fact, I lost money doing this. But that is not my motive. I'm motive my motive is a world without war, without hatred, without prejudice. And, and the possibility that that might occur is enough incentive for me to go on working in this direction. I see no reason to work for a personal life. A personal life is shallow and also bankrupts the human brain. I would say people that live to themselves die to themselves. And they have nothing to show for it because they have no meaning in life at all. And so when you work for a cause or something you believe in, no matter what, what it is, you're working because you believe in that something, because you accept that something as more rewarding than, than financial gain. That's why I believe people uh, do this sort of thing. So the motivation for people is the end goal toward working toward a society with less crime, less aberrant behavior, more security, restoration of the environment, restoring the oceans to as near a natural condition as possible. And if that isn't incentive enough, I'm not interested in people whose incentive is only motivated by money. One of the questions was, what would give people the incentive to learn something like mathematics because it's so arduous a job for so many years? We don't teach mathematics. We give them a reason to want to learn mathematics. That's quite different than teaching children how to read. Instead of teaching them how to read, we would give them a reason to want to learn to read. This is very different than teaching people the ABC or spelling or mathematics or chemistry. What motiv motivates a person to study chemistry? Well, could he make a lot of money as a chemist? Not necessarily. He'd make more money as an investment banker. So why doesn't everybody become investment bankers? Why doesn't everybody become part of the establishment. The assumption that uh, access to the necessities of life will kill incentive, uh, that has to be a myth because all wealthy people that do have access to whatever they want have not lost their incentive. In fact, some that I've known told me that they work more than eight hours a day in fact, they work all the time because they have other things they'd rather do. This does not apply to all wealthy people, but a great many of them have many interests which they pursue. So if that were true, wealthy people would be 
who would be non-creative, the most non-creative class in the world. It all depends on the background of the person. If they're brought up in a creative environment, they will always think creatively. You mentioned something about it's the end goal, but I mean, it's not really an end goal. Even when people have things and you clean up the environment and occupy everybody's house and fed, there are always other goals that people will have. They're always been looking into the future to improve things. I agree with you. So that's I the agree motivation. That. They're, not, they're not frozen and said, we made it, we're happy. Now, you know, this is it. They're always looking to do something better, so that's a motivation. Okay, so instead of a person studying real hard to make money, they study real hard because they want the knowledge. So when you look at the early scientists, they did a lot of work which was not commercially reinforcing. They wanted to know the nature of electricity. They wanted to understand the world around them. They wanted to understand geology geography, the rotation of the earth, atmospheric conditions. There's no money in understanding that, collecting such information. Sergi got a chunder boat, worked for years trying to understand the nature of plants and their responses, and inorganic materials and how it behaved. And I would say the real scientist is more concerned with knowledge, more concerned with how well a system works. And if he has no concern for people, and if his motivation is only money, I would say that most people distrust people whose motivation is only money. I would say that also, in raising children, we would raise them and reward them. By reward, you can pat them on the back. You don't have to give them anything. You could say, I deeply appreciate the work you're doing. I hope you get something out of it. And the child says, yes, I've been growing plants for two years and I've sure learned a lot about what not to do as well as what to do. So if you reward children for incentive, for moving forth in a social way, social concern, they will manifest their behavior in relation to social concern. If you motivate them by giving them a prize or a package or a reward like money for everything if they do their homework, this is not good. This is not a healthy reward. This does not develop their thinking ability. It just develops their ability to make money. And I would say that making money can make it possible for you to get certain things. But studying the nature of the physical world is far more rewarding than the monetary gain. I've known lots of people that are very wealthy monetarily and live in poverty mentally. I think too when people are studying things in the future and working on things and they see it go right into the society and the advantages directly into the society that that's reinforcing as well. Yes, like a teacher who's working on children, he can, she or he can see the children grow and use tools in a more effective way. When children are going to school, their incentive is a pat on the back, or their incentive is the teacher said, you're a good mathematician. But just learning math without a direction is a nothing thing. When you have a reason to want to learn math, to feed hundreds of thousands of people, and if you gain reward by doing that, I would say it's much more reinforcing than monetary or a trophy or a Nobel Prize. People do not do research for a Nobel Prize. They do research because they're interested in the problem. The prize is a secondary thing. So that's what I've got to say about incentive, unless you have further questions. Several times you talk about socio-cybernearing should be voted least likely to succeed. You remember saying that? Yes. I can relate to that. I feel like we're probably more apt to just destroy each other, but I, I kind of feel that that's the most likely, but I do get something personal out of it. But we all do. Guys, you know? But you're getting something personal out of it. I think we all are. But what are you doing with that information? You are trying to get it out to other well, I'm people. I'm trying to get it out to other people, but I do get a... 
I do get that pat on the back from people, comments that they leave that are nice, and they say, shit, Jock helps me with my depression, you, you know, and, and so there is a personal, I, I have no expectation that this will ever come about. Okay. I did at one point. Yes. The more I see where people are at, I just feel hopeless. <clears throat> I feel like Carl a little bit does. Well, why do you keep I, working at it? I just get something out of it. Okay. But I we all get little. something out of it. We all get something out of it because instead of sitting around doing nothing about the condition of the world or just complaining about it, it's doing nothing. If you point out all the shortcomings of the world without offering some possible alternative, you're doing nothing and there's no satisfaction. That's what about the people of India that renounce all material wealth in exchange for spiritual growth. Yeah, spiritual, but to me that's arrested development. To me that's sh that's waiting for things to happen when you can learn the tools to make things happen that's great. through the scientific method, which is a much better approach. I wouldn't I would want to take that metaphysical mentality away from them, but add more tools to enhance it, to have it become a reality instead of waiting for it to happen. No, yeah. Why would you not want to take those away, metaphysical Well, immediately tools? overnight, no, because I know they would be lost. Yes. I think they would be lost and become yeah. depressed they yes. Okay, so here we're dealing with incentive and motivation. I don't have to tell you to do this and do that because you're, in order to help this project, you take on these responsibilities. If you wish to see it happen, you put out effort. The effort you put out has to do with your upbringing. You know, some people don't have the energy you might have or the motivation you might have. But if you're motivated to think in terms of human suffering, war, and the horrors of war, and the horrors of having a value system that cripples you, that makes you suffer, and makes you argumentative, and makes it difficult for you to have a pleasant life, it seems to me that it's very difficult for people to have a pleasant life if they're only motivated by money. Uh, if, if they don't understand that, I'll do another one. I met a guy in Haiti many years ago, I'd say about 50 years ago, and he had a book under his arm, <coughs> Science and Sanity, by Alfred Korzybski. He got it from the library, but the shirt he was wearing looked like somebody blew up a hand grenade in it. It was shattered, <laughs> and he wore that but he, he loved reading, and he used to sit out in the park on benches and read and had no motivation whatever, whatsoever, to own a car, a house, a family, nothing like that. He renounced the material world in exchange for knowledge. Now, knowledge to him meant more to him than anything else, marriage, love, he didn't even know what love was in this system. He saw people that were in love, that had gotten divorced, that get into fights, that things don't always work out so nice. As the package says, they got married, walked into the sunset, and lived happily ever after. I would say that's more propaganda than reality. So I would say that if you know how to raise children, if you study books, like Science and Human Behavior by B.F. Skinner. You'll get a lot of tools for motivating children. But if you don't read books, if you just read books on mathematics, fit, physics, chemistry, you'll have knowledge in those areas. But if you fail to read books on psychology, like the books I recommend, not any book on psychology, a lot of them will retard you. If you read certain books on psychology, it'll set you back. The teachings of Sigmund Freud will set you back. The teachings of, of many people who, who are respected in this society will set you back. How to win friends and influence people. Books like that are corrupt. They do not deal with winning friends and influencing people. It's motivational technology, which is good for sales only. And when you sell a lot of products, you might become neurally bankrupt, although you're a good salesman. So I'm saying there are books that can help you understand 
how to motivate children. And uh, once you learn that, you'll notice that it works. And you'll know that you cannot go back to the older system and hope that your children become smart and hope that your children become creative. But if you know how to make them creative, which I have talked about in many sessions, in one instance of making my own child creative, I, I tell this story many times and I don't mind repeating it again. I wanted my boy to become very creative. I said, how do you do that? So I don't know. So I read the lives of many famous people. What made them creative? I found out what those mechanisms were. And so the way it was applied, I talked to my son about animals in the zoo. And he said to me, Daddy, can we go to the zoo to see these animals? I said, yes. He said with great anxiety, when? I said, next month. Next month? He didn't like that at all, but I wanted to build a hunger in him for it. And when Saturday approached a month later, he says, we're going to the zoo tomorrow, aren't we? I said, yes, we are. And I noticed in doing that, delaying it, he really studied every animal. If I took him right to the zoo, he probably hoped the monkeys would jump around. So kids throw spitballs at the monkeys to get them to jump around, you know. And so I found that most kids are more than fulfilled. They're given rewards, toys, all kinds of things, and they got a closet full of toys, and the parents wonder why they have no incentive, because they haven't been rewarded for what they do. They've been rewarded, period, because Daddy didn't have all those toys when he was young. So they buy the kid all the stuff they never had, and they wonder why their kid behaves like a blob. So when I took my kid to the zoo, I said, when he was looking at all the animals, when he seemed to have terrific drive towards studying the animals, I said, I have a business appointment in town. I had no such appointment, but I took him away from that when he was high. And uh, I put drawing paper in his bedroom and clay. I knew what would happen when he came back. He saw all that stuff, he started to make animals out of the clay. He made giraffes and dinosaurs, they weren't very good. So I said to him, outside and play. He said, but I like being alone, cream, making things. I said, outside and play with the other kids. Since he learned to like being by himself, he didn't depend on the other kids for reward. Or oh, that'll never fly, or I can run faster than you. All he met was, was competitive behavior. Not all kids, but most kids. And so that was not good. But at home, when he was making all the animals and enjoying it with a great big grin on his face, when I set out and play, I disrupted that creativity, which he couldn't wait to get back to. Do you understand? Now, he became very good at illustrating and making things. My little girl, when she was three years old, I wanted her to think about the environment. So I put a wrench on her, not the wrong way, and it kept slipping off. And I put her on the wrong way again, intentionally. And she was three years old, she put her little hands on her hips and said, Daddy, that's no way to do it. So I put her on the wrong way again, she says, I'll have to show you how. And that is getting kids to participate. I made a cardboard house and I glued the windows on too high and I glued the door on the wrong angle. And my little girl said, that's crooked, that door. I said, what's the matter with it? She said, oh, it's crooked. I said, I don't understand. So she said, I'll show you. She put it on right. She put the windows in the right place, the door in the right place. I invited participation. Uh, I wanted my little girl to be interested in music. So I knew the girl next door that had a piano that could play. And she liked certain music. And uh, when she sat at the piano, I told the other little girl to interrupt her when she's beginning to say, hey, this is fun. She's got a little tune, Yankee Doodle, one, two, town. You know, when she played a little bit of something, she goes, I have to practice again. She's, oh, gee, you know. 
And so you interrupt that. And she, then I say, do you want to take music lessons? She says, when? But if you let them say that till they saturate, it kills incentive. Do you understand? You have to understand human motivation, not the desire that your children will become smart and hope that they'll become smart. There's a way of making them smart, of health, helping them to become smart. Because this is what's missing in our society. Parents don't study children. But if they want to buy a house or furnish a kitchen, they get a gas range, a refrigerator, uh, oven, a washing machine, because they know what those machines do. But if they don't know what they do, they don't, they're not, they don't miss it. If you go to a primitive or poor, impoverished family uh, in Mexico or Africa, they don't even think of a washing machine. They take their clothing down to the river and wash it. If you showed them a washing machine, they would grin. If you showed them what it did, and they had no electrical outlet, they could not enjoy that. So, the more people understand about the world they live in, not transactions or gain of material wealth, the more they understand their transactions and sharing ideas with other people, the richer they become. Now the word rich today means money and power. In the future, rich means fulfilling, living a fulfilling life, a life that has meaning to you. You always study some profession, your relatives suggest that you study to make a living. Radio repair, computer repair. What do you want to do with your life? Well, I don't know. Well. You can get kids interested in anything. You can get them interested in joining the army, or killing other people, or hating Filipinos, Jews, Swedes, or Italians, or anybody, by bringing them up in an environment that generates hatred. Fulfillment means if a child is brought up in a wide variety of situations, and they become interested in situations, and you interfere with the interest, at that time, as they show interest, interfere with and say, we have to go home now, because I, I, I like to watch those animals. I like watching that movie. Take them out of it sometimes. Then they want to get back to it. And they want to get back to it and watch it differently than they watched it before. But if you don't know what motivates people, it's hard for you to know how to generate incentive. You buy them a book on math. Well, that doesn't generate incentive. You buy a book on strange animals in the world today. That might cause them to want to look at the pictures of strange animals. But if you show them typical things, they don't motivate kids. You have to show them things that motivate that child you're working on. If your child shows no motivation in anything, it means that you have expose them to many things without them being reinforcing to that child. If I take my child to many dances and ball games and uh, card games and things like that, many things, he will just accept that. But if you take him to something that he's interested in and take him away from it, he'll want to get back to it. So that is, motivation is a science. Science of human behavior has not come about yet. There's very few psychologists that really know how to motivate people. They really think that this system is the best system. And they try to adjust people to this system. That is not a motivational system. When behavior becomes a science, then we will know how to make engineers, chemists, people with high output, and people would, whatever you want, you will know how to generate that. And the schools of the future will be motivational institutions that know how to motivate human behavior. So although people have access to the necessities of life, they are still unfulfilled in questions that they want to know about. What is life? What is living tissue? What makes cancer? 
What makes heart disease? These are the things that people would concern themselves with in the future. Not how, how does my new diet look? Or how do you like my new earrings? That's not any healthy motivation. That's decadent motivation. Or negative motivation. So in order to generate positive motivation, you have to learn more about the behavioral sciences. Look at our website. We have a lot of books we recommend. And if you wish to learn more about it, look up those books. Check them out of the library if you can't afford them. And read them if you want to know what moves humans. Well, the only way to really learn is to come out here. But waiting for a person to evolve on their own mm -hmm. can take years and years. Mm -hmm. Well, in one day I can give them a lot of stuff they can use. And so a lot of people want to know what they can do to help. That's motivation. So they need to read books that are different. Science and Human Behavior. Can you remember that book? It really does give people a lot of bits. B.F. Skinner. Uh, a lot of people hear the true love stories. It's all a lot of bunk, you know. They'll never get fulfilled with those, reading those things. No, and the, their expectations. Yeah, I know. Unreal. They're, they're a dream. People marry and find their marriage uncomfortable, so they read true romance, where the guy is fully understanding, and he always listens to his wife. The wife says, why can't you be like George? See? So their concept of fulfillment is erroneous. Whatever you got is what you've got. That's what you have to deal with, which is terrible. I wish it were the other <laughs> way. I think that's enough on motivation. Okay. I'll let it go with that.